Welcome, uh, everybody. Good to see so many faces and also so many familiar faces. Uh, I have the honor to kick off uh, the day. Um, and I would like to, to start with a personal introduction for those of you who don't know me. Uh, you might think the picture on screen is a reference to our new name, Rewire, but actually, actually it's not. I was wondering who recognizes this picture? Who knows what it is? Yes, please. Very good, it's a, it's a motherboard. It's Intel 8088. It was the, the IBM PC XT 1990, more or less. Uh, I expect the ASML people in the room also knew this. Um, and this was my first uh, personal computer when I was about 10, 11 years old. Um, I've had a passion for technology all my life. Um, and uh, as a young kid, uh, I, would, I was always exploring electronics, computers, tinkering. Uh, with stuff, and th I think that that to some extent continued uh, throughout my life. And I think the the current age uh, uh, is for me a candy store, right? And new developments come out uh, almost daily. Um, so much so that even I have a hard time uh, catching up and, and staying staying abreast with all of that. So that is what uh, what today is about. And um, you might uh, might wonder why do we need. Uh, why do we need another data and AI event? Because, yeah, you know, we all read the news. Um, and we have to go back to the, to the 17th century, I think, to answer that, uh, to answer that question. Um, anyone recognizes this? If you look closely, not much has changed since, because this is a basic, uh, basic slide projector. Um, this is the magic lantern. Uh, invented uh, around 1600 uh, something, uh, and basically it's a slide projector. But it was not only used as a as a slide projector; it was also used by charlatans, magicians, uh, people entertaining uh, audiences to create illusions. And this is the origin of the saying "smoke and mirrors," and because they used smoke mirrors with the magic lantern to basically create live projections in the air, in the smoke. Um, and they went even so far as to say that this was proof for the life beyond. They could bring back the dead uh, and, uh, and prove supernatural phenomenon with this. So the magic lantern uh, basically became much more than a slide projector, uh, but actually a way of, um, yeah, of, 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 of creating illusions that, uh, that were, well, by definition, not, uh, not real. Um, and you could say to some extent that, uh, that artificial intelligence is today's magic lantern. We've all seen these pictures, right? <coughs> in, in talks like this, you can't surprise people anymore because, because everything, everybody has seen it. Um, but I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm still I'm going to try to, uh, to, to sort of sparkle your imagination and curiosity today a little bit. Um, because obviously this is Sora, uh, OpenAI's uh, video, well, whatever you want to call it, video production tool. Uh, but there's more to it, and that's the, actually the animation on the left, which is a, a pirate ship in a coffee cup. Um, and if you look at OpenAI's website, they proclaim that they're not working on video production or automation or whatever, uh, but they actually intend to model the physical world. And the claim here is, look, this is first proof. You know, these models don't only produce video, but they're actually modeling fluid dynamics. And that's a very big deal, if that is true. And obviously it's not true, uh, at least. I, I think I'm one of the more skeptical ones, but uh, those are the claims being made, you know? And the path is, well, if we can actually use these models to model the physical world, that, that's a big step towards artificial general intelligence. So if AI is today's magic lantern, um, it begs the, begs the question, where's the smoke and where are the mirrors? Um, and people leading organizations, but you could say anyone working in an organization, in today's developments, um, yeah, has to or should ponder a couple of questions right, around how good is this AI capability today? How good is it really? Is it overhyped? Um, and what is the trajectory? You know, is it continuing to go at this pace or are we slowing down? Are we accelerating? At the same time, how should I respond 
do we need to jump on it? Do we need to wait and see a bit? Because every, let everybody else uh, do the first, uh, experience the growing pains, and you know, then I will adopt whatever works. And what are the threats and what are the risks? So these are general, typical questions, but I think given the pace that we are in, they become more, more paramount uh, to answer. Um, and um, yeah, just to, to give a few ideas, um, or, or hints at these questions, one would be to look at the industry leaders, right? The people that are developing uh, all of these new technology. Uh, but the question is whether we can trust them. Uh, Sam Altman, obviously we know them, he's looking for seven trillion dollars. I think the GDP of Germany is what, four or five trillion? Um, so, yeah, um, we'll give him that. Um, I think last week, uh, Eric Schmidt, um, ex-Google CEO, his statement on TV was, I think actually AI is underhyped. Yeah? He said the arrival of a non-human intelligence is a very, very big deal. And then the interview, interviewer asked, but is it here? And his answer was, it's here, it's coming, it's, it's almost there. Okay, what is it? Is it here or is it coming? What, what, what is it? But anyway, he thinks it's underhyped. Um, well, obviously we need to look at the data. But even that is not trivial, uh, because if you look at uh, generative AI, large language models, and how to measure their performance, it's not super easy. But there is a whole range of benchmarks out there today, which you see in this, in this slide. Um, and one thing is clear, the, the frontier is, is being pushed, right? These are kind of the maximum performance levels that large language models achieve nowadays across a whole bunch of different benchmark measures and measuring AI performance, especially generative AI, is, is, not, is not so easy because how do you determine if a response is actually accurate or not? You, know, you can't measure it uh, as easily. But in any case, um, we see the, the field progressing and we've all seen the news around uh, models beating bar exams and what happened. Um, and, and, but the key thing here is that all this process, all this progress, is basically based on one hypothesis. And that is what is called the AI scaling hypothesis. And that means basically, as long as we throw more data and compute at it, we'll, we'll advance, we'll get ahead. Um, and to some extent, that is the, the kind of secret hypothesis that these people are, are, are basing their, their, their claims on. Uh, and obviously there are incentives for the industry to make the public, to make the world believe that, that we're close to, uh, to artificial general intelligence. So we can't fully trust them, in my, in my opinion, and we have to keep looking at the data, but the data tells us we're still advancing. Okay, so what does that mean? Because current systems are anything but perfect. And I also don't have to tell you this, you must have seen ample examples. One from Air, Air Canada, you know, they deployed a, a chatbot for their customer service and the chatbot gave away a free flight. It was a, you know, bug in the system in the end uh, and he even when they went to court uh, to uh, to reclaim it but but the customer won and the court said yeah look uh, it's your system and gave away free flight so don't complain so that that then brings us to kind of the skeptical view um, and a couple of points here um, are, are good to uh, to recognize uh, I think arguments that people in the field and that are close to it, experts you could say, uh, but the, which are more on the skeptical pr uh, spectrum. What are their arguments about the progress? Um, one is about large language modeling or generative AI in general, and that is that the flaws that we're seeing are not bugs to be fixed, right? So it's not the gro that there are growing pains, they say, like, yeah, this is temporary, we have the first versions, it will be fixed. They say, no, that's not the case. The way this technology works, by definition, has this, these flaws. So that these flaws are features, they're not bugs. Um, and part of that is that actually the models do not represent how the world works. So they don't have a world understanding, they just produce text in the case of a large language model. Um, and on top of that, they claim that there are diminishing returns. So if you analyze the performance, for instance, of all the open AI stuff that is, that is coming out, they claim, look, if you look at the benchmarks, it's not really progressing that much anymore. Um, and open AI, you know, they, they still haven't 
launched GPT-5, so they're probably, probably struggling. Um, and all the, the claims are based on these scaling laws, and those scaling laws can't go on forever. We've used all the data in the world, all the internet uh, by now. Um, so, so we're probably hitting a plateau. I'm not saying this is true, I'm just saying this is the skeptical view, right? So on the one hand, we hear all the progress and all the promises, but there are also people saying, look, that's actually not the case if you really look under the hood of these systems. Um, and then lastly, you know, coming to the question of any leader in an organization, what do I need to, need to do? How fast is this going? Um, economists, like how will it change our organizations? Um, and also there, the, the predictions vary. This was in the, on the left, I think also last week or so in the, financial, the Dutch Financial Times. An economist saying um, it's overhyped, uh, it's the same as always, all past technology revolutions took time, uh, it will be the same this time. On the other hand, a recent report that came out on the right, which says this time is different. Generative AI is generally the different type of technology, and this is going to go much faster. Implication being, if you don't stay, you know, stay ahead, if you don't, uh, don't participate as an organization, you're going to be left behind soon. Uh, and the argument for generative AI was, the infrastructure is already there. It's not like electricity, where we need to, need to build uh, you know, power lines and all of that stuff. For, for generative AI, the infrastructure is there. We all, the, the cloud uh, is rolled out. Um, software has become modular. Um, so, and, and, and by the way, the technology itself is very intuitive. It's very easy for people to interact with it because it's based on natural language. So all of those arguments for him uh, were the basis of saying, you know, this is going to go much faster. And I think talking to a few of you, I think some of us recognize that, uh, how easy this, this new technology hits the road. Um, on the other hand, there's a difference between adopting new tools and really changing your, your organization. So uh, when we think about the application, we as Rewire, about the implication of, of all these developments, um, yeah, we obviously try to make sense of um, these polarized views and form our own view of what is really happening and what does it mean for our clients, for our partners, the people that we work with. Um, Three key takeaways for today to set you up, and, uh, and, and we have an agenda that hopefully help you kind of with these three points. And the first one is that we firmly believe that everybody um, needs to, to develop their own intuition and understanding of AI, especially because we're living in this in-between smoke and mirror phase. Uh, the fact that we call it AI is because it doesn't actually quite work yet. Because if, if it works flawlessly, it's not AI anymore, right? That's another often mentioned uh, joke, but it does mean that it's important uh, for people in organizations that have the role of shaping their organization to understand the technology and develop their own compass of what can it do for us uh, and how to navigate this change. And that is also the second point um, that we strongly believe that you need to think fundamentally. Uh, you need to think about redesigning things, re-engineering things, reimagining your organization, asking what if, rather than adopting a tool, a point solution, or whatever. But think, thinking fundam fundamentally, how is my organization uh, going to evolve towards, let's say, what would it look like in five years' time, and how do we get there? Um, and that is then also the third point, um, that yes, I agree with the fact of this Andrew McAfee, the economist that says generative AI is different because it goes faster. Yes, to a certain extent that's true. Uh, but not to the point where full business models and full organizations, end-to-end -end processes change, because uh, those are also the implication of, of AI technology. And that is still hard work. That is still transformational work, tra transformational change that doesn't happen overnight. So again there, it's a bit boring, but the answers are nuanced. It's, it's, it's not at either side of the extreme. Um, it, is, it is still uh, also a long-term uh, long-term gain in terms of how to uh, how to reap the, the benefits of this, this new technology. Um, so with these, I'm going to leave you with the, with these three uh, three questions, and we have a beautiful agenda today with many exciting speakers and guests uh, th that are going to help us and inspire us. So I want to hand over to to Simon to uh, to introduce the agenda.